Amen. Please be seated. We were talking before the service about how all these songs are great. Uh, and I'm like, can we just sing more? It's been so wonderful. Well, as we turn to our time in the Word this morning, we're uh, in the, the end of the book of Galatians. So we're in Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 through 18, uh, not 1 through 10, 11 through 18. And um, we're going to look at these verses this week, and then next week we'll do our kind of recap, where we read the whole book and talk about all of the things, not all of the things, but the overall concepts that we've been working through throughout the series. So I'm really looking forward to that. Those are always my favorite times when we get to hear it all together. Uh, mostly because I have trouble remembering how it all fits together. But that's also, for me, the most exciting part, is that these are not just isolated things that Paul is saying, but this is part of a, a whole letter that he is writing all at once to these people. As we begin this morning, uh, before that, I just want to remind us of the last couple weeks at least, uh, we looked at the contrast between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, and then we looked at how, through the Spirit, we partner with each other to grow in Christ. And those are really important things, but they also then set the stage for how Paul ends the letter. Uh, so as he wraps things up, he's not doing that in isolation from what he just said. And in fact, I would, I would say his argument to finish the letter is built on what he's just said about how the Spirit uses each of us to be a part of the work that he's doing in each other's lives to build each other up in Christ. And that, that selflessness, that giving of one another's time and energies to each other is actually a, a significant part of why Paul says we should hear what he has to say and not what these other teachers have to say. And so that's where we're going to begin this morning, is with that concept. So uh, Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 through 18, I'll go ahead and read those and pray, and then we'll, we'll get going. Paul says, see what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my marks Sorry, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you once again for this letter and for this journey that you've brought us on as a church as we've studied it and, and learned from it. Lord, I pray that we would continue to be changed by it. As we look at this final portion this morning, as we review it next week, and as you continue to bring to mind these things in the weeks, months, and years to come, Lord, I pray that we would be those who are focused on the new creation as what matters most and not distracted by the other things that so often gain our attention. Lord, would you continue to do the work of crucifixion in each of our lives that we might, with Paul, take up this 
this boast in the cross of Christ through which the world has been crucified to us and us to the world. It's in his name that we pray all these things. Amen. So I'm calling this one more time because Paul doesn't really introduce anything new in this section. He's rehashing what he's been saying at various points throughout the letter. He's trying one more time to appeal to them to not listen to the false teachers, but to instead focus on the, the true teaching of the gospel that they received from Paul, that um, they've seen to be true through not only the word of God, but also the spirit working in their lives. We're going to start by uh, looking at this concept of beware self-centered teaching. Beware self-centered teaching is where we're starting. Um, And actually, I'm not sure. If you guys don't have that ready, I can do it without the points because I wasn't convinced that those are the right ones anyway. So this might be a good sign from the Lord that those were not the right ones anyway. Uh, But that's where I see this starting out is... He's, he's coming back to this idea that these guys are teaching them something that they shouldn't believe, but, but here it's specifically rooted in this idea that the only reason that they're teaching this is for their own selfish gain anyway, that they don't care about you. They're, they're te- they, they want you to do this because it makes them look good. And there are not many of us who can identify super closely with people telling us that in order to be good Christians, we need to be circumcised. That's not, I've not heard of that being a a teaching that's widely spread in the church in North America in the 21st century. Uh, But I imagine if we stop and think about it, we can all think about teachers we've met or seen on the internet or heard on the radio or wherever that if we were to think about it, we would realize are just in it for themselves. They're not teaching us because they care about us. They're not even teaching because they care particularly strongly about what's true. They're just teaching because of what's in it for them. And those are folks that we should be concerned about, that we should not be looking to follow. Uh, That's a huge portion of Paul's argument here. Now, in other places, he's made it very clear that he, they should worry about this teaching and, 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 and not follow it because it's false. But here, he doesn't even make that, that specific claim. Here, he's just saying, you, you should be concerned about them because they're not concerned about you. That's, that's his, his final argument against these false teachers, is they only care about themselves. They don't even care about the teaching that they're teaching because, he says in um, verse 13, not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they they want you to do that. And he made the argument earlier in the book, you you take this one part of the law on yourself, you have to take the whole thing, now you're condemned by it, it's a huge problem for you, but they don't care about the huge problem for you. They just care about this one surface issue that makes them feel better. It helps them avoid persecution. It, they, they get to say that, look, at, look we've, we've done these things to make these people do the right things. All of that is seen in false teaching today, has been throughout the centuries, that there are so many examples of teachers who will distort the message of God's word in order to make themselves look better to make it seem like they are doing good work because of the external change of the people that they're teaching, who manage to avoid the hardship of persecution for the sake of the cross by avoiding the hard teaching of crucifixion. That all of these things are common to false teachers wherever they are, whenever they are, and whatever the specific message is that they're trying to to convince people of. And so that's something that we should take to heart, 
that before we move on from this idea that, well, we don't, we don't need to worry about them because we don't have people teaching this specific false message, to recognize that a significant problem with them was not just the message, but the motives behind their teaching that message. And so that's something we need to be on alert for. When we are, are listening to, to new teachers, old teachers, any teachers, and we hear them saying things that don't align with the message of the gospel in particularly um, gospel-shaped ways, in, 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 in these ways that I'm going to wait and get to explaining until we get to the Paul part, but uh, when we see these, these variations, we should be looking, asking the question, why? Why are they teaching this variation? Of what, what would happen, not only for us, but also for them, if we believed this variation? That that's a part of testing whether or not this message is from God, is testing the, the potential of the motives behind it. If somebody's teaching a message that only benefits them, that's a pretty good sign that it's not from God's word. It's, it's from the person teaching it. Um, if, if they're proclaiming a message of fear that just leads us to depend on them more, is that from God? If they're teaching us a message of comfort that prevents us from doing the hard work of examining ourselves to see if we're in step with the Spirit, is that from God? That there are so many examples and iterations of this that I can't really get into all of them, and yet I encounter them all the time. People who, who claim to be teaching from God's word, who are teaching a message that only helps themselves and does great damage to all who hear and receive it. And this, is, this is a starting point for analyzing that, that whoever it is, do this with me, by all means, anyone who claims to be teaching God's word, this is a, a part of the litmus test to determine, to, to decipher, to discern whether or not this person is actually teaching the gospel or something else. Beware self-centered teaching. But I want to actually focus less on the, the people to worry about and more on, so what do we do instead? So this is where my points are going to kind of fall apart. So we could probably actually just use the title slide if you want, AJ. I'm, I'm fine with that. Let's just do that. Uh, one more time. All right. Because uh, really these la my I had it as two points, but they blend together. So I'm just going to just unpack what I see here. And hopefully that'll help. Um, I had it as embrace those who embrace the cross and then find everything in new creation. But I'm going to blend it because I think that that's going to help me be more clear in my explanation. Paul is starting with what we would see as kind of an odd statement. So in verse 11, he says, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. What is he, what, what's he talking about? Has he written the whole letter that way? Does, does he have a crayon going? What, what's happening? This is not maybe how we put together letters, but it's actually very common in his day that most of the letter would have been written by someone else. They had a fancy word for that that I'm not going to use right now. Uh, but they, had a, they would have a person that that was their job was to sit there and make sure that it was not only written in a way that could be read, so that it's neat handwriting, but also they would, they would look to smooth out some of the language, correct some of the grammatical errors. So Paul doesn't have to be a wonderful orator in order for this to be understood. Now, I don't know that they were correcting a lot of Paul's speech, but we do have reason to believe that Paul was not a great writer. He was a great speaker, maybe, but not a great writer. 
And so Paul, in most of his letters, refers to this idea that this is a person, there is another person who's doing the actual physical writing. And at this point, because he's so concerned that they don't miss it, he takes the pen for himself and says, I want to get this as clear as I can. So he's drawing attention to it. I'm not sure. I've heard I, a lot of people have compared it to if you put it in bold, all caps, underlined, italicized, all the things. Maybe, but I think that's in the, in a sense that's actually weakening the the what Paul's doing here. But but that's a a start in that direction. Is he's he's trying to draw special attention to the fact that this part is so important to him, he's not going to entrust it to another person. It's it's really saying just pay close attention to what comes next. So, see with what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. He then, he lays into those false teachers and then contrasts himself. So he says, may I never boast... So they boast in what they've done in terms of getting people circumcised. May I never boast in anything other than in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, which I pointed out earlier in the book, but I'll remind us, is not just saying he's boasting that Christ died. He's saying that. But more than that, he's referring to the instrument of humiliation He's referring to to the curse associated with anyone who endures that specific type of execution. He's referring to the things that these false teachers don't want associated with them. So he says, they, in earlier, he says, uh, they do this to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Paul's saying, "I, I want association with that. I want people to, when, if, if there's anything that I'm going to say, this is, who, this is an amazing thing about who I am, it's that I'm associated with this humiliating thing that no one would otherwise take any pride in. Why? And, and then he continues on, through which the world has been crucified to to me and I to the world. Again, there's that death imagery, but there's also that sense of humiliation, that, that the world finds him embarrassing and he finds them embarrassing, that there is no commonality left in Paul's mind. He's just looking at this contrast and saying, I I don't want to do anything for their approval because all that matters is the approval of the one who gave himself for me. So I'm not going to do anything that brings me glory, that brings me praise, that brings me honor other than to proclaim him, the one who deserves all that praise and glory and honor. That's That's where Paul finds all of his basis for all of his teaching, is that this one event, the death of the Messiah on on this instrument of humiliation, is what changes the whole world. It turns the whole system upside down. What matters is not these old things of, this separation through circumcision and uncircumcision, what matters is the new creation. That through his death, through his sacrifice, through his humiliation, through all these things, through the the servant attitude with which Christ did all these things, that through all of this, he flips everything upside down and makes it all new. That the old paradigms don't mean anything anymore. It's all about what he has done to to completely change those who would follow him. And how the world works. So that the world doesn't work anymore by people showing that they are better than other people. The world works by people recognizing their need for a savior. 
and coming to him and being led by him, that all these things revolve around what Christ did for his people to make them into a people. That there's no distinction now between ethnicities in the kingdom of God. There's only a distinction between those who are in the kingdom because of the cross and those who are out of the kingdom because they're offended by it. That all of this is what Paul has been explaining through this whole book. And now he comes down to it and says, this is it. It's about embracing the new creation of living in because of the spirit's leading living as if that kingdom is already here even though we await with great hope and anticipation the time when he will return to establish it visibly we know that it's at work among us already as he transforms us that these are the things that drive paul to live and breathe in such a way that when he looks at the the intense persecutions that he's getting for it, he says it's worth it. These scars, these marks on my body that I have received because of Christ, these are proof that I'm not in it for myself. So don't let anybody cause Paul any more trouble. There's no no good reason to question his motives. He's shown, he's proven that he is all in for somebody else. A lot of somebody else. I don't know how you'd say that in plural. A lot of other people. He's not in it for himself. He, He... lays down his life for others because of the Savior who laid down his life for them and for Paul. That he recognizes that this is the way of Jesus, is to not be in it for yourself, but instead to be so sold out for the one who rescued us that we are willing to give up everything and anything for them too. That embracing the new creation is both a recognition of the incredible gifts that we've received from God through Christ, as well as a willingness to sell all that we have to buy that field. To see that as the greatest treasure that nothing on this earth could ever compare to in such a way That whatever trials may come, whatever difficulties come with it, we don't run from those. We don't water down the message to avoid that trouble. But we see it as as part of being crucified to the world and the world being crucified to us. That we recognize that these difficulties are part of pursuing the treasure that's more valuable than anything else. That following Christ is not just sitting. It's not just letting him do all the work. He does the work. Don't get me wrong. But it's a recognition that the work that he is doing leads us to be a part of the work he's doing in the lives of others as well. That the work that he is doing leads us to roll up our sleeves and join in. The work that he is doing is a call to action in the lives of other people. That all of this is a a blending of the things that Paul's been teaching throughout the book. And so, without getting too far ahead of myself into next week, that's truly what he does in this section. He weaves together all these, these threads that he's been working at. And that's part of why throughout the book I've said, well, let's not forget what he said in chapter 1 and chapter 2 and over here in chapter 3. That all of this for Paul fits together like a puzzle. 
that you take out a piece and the whole thing just falls apart. There's probably a better illustration than a puzzle for that, but that's the idea, is that you don't get just one part of it. You, whatever part of the gospel you might be drawn to, you don't only get that part. You get the whole thing. It's a package deal. You take or leave all of it. And in this specific instance, as he's talking about what, what others are trying to do to lead them astray, he's recognizing that there are so many temptations that will turn our focus away from both the gift and the calling that come as that package deal. And, and what he wants us to focus on 100% is the gift is greater than anything else and the calling is 100% worth it. I was listening to an audiobook this week um, recounting the life of a, a, a former pastor. He's, he's uh, no longer with us, um, but uh, I was talking about his influences. And, and one of the, the things they talked about was this other pastor who influenced him so much that people often don't know which pastor to attribute this quote to. But this quote, for me, I just went, yes, this fits exactly with what Paul is talking about as he in the middle of all this weaves in these words about peace and mercy and grace cheer up you are more utterly sinful than you could ever imagine and you are more deeply loved than you could ever dare hope You're more utterly sinful. Your, your need is greater than you can even imagine. And yet, the love of God is so much greater than all of that. You couldn't even hope to be loved that much. It's that great. And that's what Paul's weaving together in this passage. And so... As he describes this, this new creation reality in which it's not about your ethnicity and it's not about external signs, it's really just about the, the Savior, the one who rescued you. He says, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule to the Israel of God. He's, he's recognizing this new reality in which all of those who are God's people receive this peace and this mercy by recognizing whose they are, who they belong to, and living accordingly. He, he sends them grace this is, a, this is a thing that, again, we use it often, we say it often, it's part of, we're going to probably use it again today as our benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. But every part of that sentence is dripping with the message that Paul has been proclaiming throughout this book. The grace, we didn't deserve it, of our Lord. He, he's the one in charge Jesus, the person who is the Messiah, may his undeserved goodness that he shows to us be with your spirit. And then, so you're not alone, but then beyond that, be with your spirit who? Brothers and sisters. Reminder of that kinship that we have in Christ. That we have been made part of the same family. That all of this is driving us to a unity that isn't focused on the external, but focused on who Jesus is and what he has done for each of us and how he has already changed our lives and continues to do so through the power of his spirit as we live in community together. It's one more time. Paul's trying to show us that this is what matters. This is what it means to be the people of God. 
This is how we should live our lives. Not worried about anything else other than, are we in step with the Spirit? How can we help each other walk in that way? We're going to have a time of reflection that is meant for you to reflect on these things and anything else that God is doing in your life. What's he put on your mind? What's he put on your heart? What are your fears, your anxieties, your concerns, your praises? What are the good things that God has done in your life this week? This is your time to reflect with God to spend time with him. But I would encourage you to consider these things too that we have heard this morning from Paul. How is our life aligned with the true message of the gospel as we've seen it this morning, as we've seen it throughout this book? And and where do we need Paul to turn our heads to help fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith? So Ben and Sophia are going to come on up, and I'll pray as they do that. But uh, then this is your time. Spend it in whatever way the Spirit leads you. But uh, this is your time to spend with him, to reflect on these things, uh, to be comforted where you need to be comforted, to be challenged where you need to be challenged. And I encourage you to spend this time focused in those ways. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can call you Father. That because of the selfless work of your Son, we have been made sons and daughters too. Lord, I pray that as we consider this morning where our lives have been centered around your kingdom and where they have not, that you would realign us with your will. That as we look at our own lives, that we would see your kingdom come and your will done here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be like Paul in the ways that he's described. That we would be those who have nothing to boast in aside from the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That the world would be crucified to us and us to the world. That we would receive the peace and mercy associated with being your children. That the grace that you've shown to us would radiate throughout our lives that we would be marked by Christ. It's in his name that we pray all these things. Amen.